Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, if you like what you're about to watch, please share and subscribe and uh, click the like button. Except in a state of obedience and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the other ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya you alladina amanu, O people of Iman, Ittaqullah, have taqwa of Allah, wa qulu qawlan sadida. And speak good words. Speak in a kind way, in a gentle way, in a straightforward way, in a way that, that brings the people's hearts together. Speak in a way that, that binds the, the, the hearts together, that removes the conflict. Speak in a way that diffuses the difficult situations. Don't speak in a way that causes division. Don't speak in a way that hurts people. قُلُوا قَوْلًا sadida. He says, if you just do this, يُسْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ I'll take care of all of your problems for you. وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ And I'll forgive you all of your sins. وَمَنْ يُتْلِ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا Whoever obeys Allah and obeys His Messenger, they have attained the greatest success. We begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We begin by praising Him, by glorifying Him, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send His peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to envelop us with His mercy in everybody that is here in this gathering today. Say Ameen. Amen. To continue, one of the amazing stories that we see in the Quran, repeated in the most multiple places, and one of the scholars said almost all of the Quran was going to be. The story of this person is the story of Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam, one of the greatest prophets of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him, you know, one of the ulul azmi min al-rusul, one of the five great chosen messengers. Musa alayhi salam's life story, if you analyze it, many of the scholars said there is three parts to it. There is the childhood of Musa alayhi salam, which he grows up and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan is amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took care of this child and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him up and how Allah prepared him for the mission that he had in his mind. And then what happened in Musa alayhi salam's confrontation with Fir'aun? Dealing with people that are arrogant, dealing with oppression, dealing with all the difficulties that the nation of Bani Israel were going through. And this is the second stage of the life of Musa alayhi salam. And the third stage is Musa alayhi salam dealing with the believers in his time and with difficulties that he went through dealing with the Muslims. And so when you look at each part of the story of Musa alayhi salam, the, star, the scholar said there are many, many lessons for us to derive from it. One time, one of the, one of the tabi'een, he was reading the, the verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing Bani Israel. And all the things that Bani Israel did, and all the things that Bani Israel, you know, caused the harm to their prophets, and all the difficulties that they put their prophets in, and how they disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this person said, man, Bani Israel were so messed up. They're so bad. And he's talking to another person. And the other tabi, he said to him, he said, don't think all the verses talking about Bani Israel is about your cousins. He said, they're actually talking about you. When we read the Quran, we read about the Jews and the Christians and how they got messed up and how they did different things. 
Sometimes a person who doesn't understand will think, man, these people are really bad. But in reality, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put their stories in the Quran for you and me? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, everything when Israel did, you're going to do. He said, you're going to follow the nations before you, even if they walked into a lizard's hole, you're going to go after them. And he said, they divided into 72 sects. You are going to divide into 73 sects. And so, in other words, the Prophet ﷺ said, you think Bani Israel was, was bad? You're going to one-up them. You're going to be worse than them in our, in our division, in our problems, and the things that we cause. And so the lessons Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us in the stories of Musa salam, how he was dealing with Bani Israel, really these were lessons for you and me. And these were lessons that we have to take to heart and apply to our condition. And see, do we have these problems with Bani Israel then? Or is this something specially for them? And so I'll tell you one story that happened. One of the stories mentioned in the Quran about Bani Israel, there was a town, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, of Bani Israel, they were living near the coast, they were a fishing town, and what they used to do is, they used to go out fishing, and you know, this was their source of livelihood. But what happened, they had a rule, a law that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. Every time the day of Saturday comes, that day you dedicate it only to the worship of Allah. You do not work, you do not do anything, you spend the whole day worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what happened, some of the people in there, they had some diseases in their hearts and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to expose it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the fish to not show up in the shores of their, their city for all the rest of the days except for Saturday. So they'd go out fishing on Monday, ah, no fish. They'd go out Tuesday, ah, one or two small fish. Uh, Wednesday, small fish. Th Thursday, small fish. Saturday, they go out just to look at what's going on in the Nemo's jumping up and down. You know, Dory's jumping up and down. They're all looking at them and saying, what's up? You can't touch me. It's Saturday. And they're like, ah, we got to find a way to get these fish. And a group of them, clever people, got together. They said, I know a way we can do this. And on the surface, it will look like we're not disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all. Because Allah said, we can't fish Saturday, fine, we will not fish Saturday. But here's the plan. We're going to go out Friday night. We're going to dig holes by the sea. When the waves come, all the water is going to get stuck inside the holes. Oh, inside the holes, we're going to put our nets. So the fish that fall into the holes, they get stuck on the nets. Saturday, we stay home and we say, Allah, Allah, Allah. Sunday, we go out and we pick up the nets. All of them loaded with fish from Saturday. Masha Allah. So smart, right? Or we thought, or they thought they're smart. So what they do, one of them, a group of them, they got together, they start doing this. New business opportunity. We got all these fish coming on Saturday. Nobody's catching them. We got an idea, right? I know we're not supposed to do it, but we'll bend a little laws here and there. I know we're not supposed, it's haram. I know it's absolutely haram. But if you look at it this way, it's not haram. And people come to you, you know, interest is haram, brother. No, but if you look at it this way, it's not haram. See, you take a chicken, you slaughter it from the back, it's haram. You slaughter it from the front and you say, Allahu Akbar, it's not haram. Slaughter a pork for me and say, Allahu Akbar, and recite Surah Yasin over it. Does it make it halal? Right? So, so some people, they take something haram and they try to justify it in all kinds of things. And this was their mentality. They try to just they play mental gymnastics with themselves and finally they confuse themselves so much that the haram looks like halal and the halal looks like haram. So this is what they were doing. And what happened? When they were doing this, another group amongst them, they said, look guys, what you're doing is wrong. It's, it's clear that this fish you're catching is from Saturday. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you should not be doing anything on Saturday except devote yourselves to Allah. So don't do this. Don't do this. A group of them became people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they were enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. In fact, this was a job Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to you and me. This is our job. We are supposed to be people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that go out and they enjoin what is good. You see a good cause, you become part of it. You see something good happening, you encourage it. And when you see something wrong happening, you're supposed to what? Get them to press the brakes on it. Stop this, this is not good. Brother, you shouldn't be smoking, you know, especially in front of your children. That's not good. What are they going to learn from you? You shouldn't be drinking. What can they learn from you? And you are role models from mankind. You're saying, I'm a Muslim. You're representing the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And so, 
A group of them, they said, brothers, you shouldn't be doing this. This is not good. And they said, no, you see, we have fatwa. We have fatwa. The mufti said we can do it. And so they start following the fatwas. They went fatwa shopping on, on uh, islamqa.com uh, or whatever qa.com they had at the time. And they had their fatwas and they had their muftis and they put their pictures on the flyers and they said, this guy and this guy and this guy, he's got all these degrees from these high places. He said, I can do it. I can do it. Doesn't matter if Allah says you can't do it. Doesn't matter if the Prophet says you can't do it. This Shaykh, this Mawlana said you can do it. So I'm doing it. Don't tell me what to do. And they went on doing their disobedience. This group went on trying to stop them. But another group emerged. They said, guys, why are you on their case? Just leave them alone. Let them bring the fish. Fine, you're not catching the fish. They're doing the sin. If it's a sin, they're going to go to hellfire. But at least they're bringing fish to the marketplace. At least we can go buy fish on, you know, on other days. So let them do their thing. The sin is on them. And you can just enjoy the benefits. Leave them alone. And they went on like this. Three groups. Finally, what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that's it. I let this go on long enough. All those who disobeyed me become apes and become, you know, hogs. They became, you know, they, their bodies were transformed into animals because in their hearts they were animals. Greed had taken over them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought them to their real form. And those that were saying, it's okay, leave them alone, they were joined with them in their punishment. Why? Because they were the silent majority that said, the evil is happening, let it happen, no problem. And the group that were saying, stop this, the group that were trying to enjoin the good and forbid the evil, this was the only group that received the mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so sometimes you have situations like this in our own families, in our own communities, in our own situations. We have people disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One group says, just leave them alone. It's okay. Another group says, no, you shouldn't be doing this. It's not good for the society. And in reality, when the punishment comes, when the day comes, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives His judgment, which side are you going to be on? Which group do you belong to? Which group does your family belong to? And we have to think about these things because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we gave them this story as an example for those who have taqwa. So that they may reflect over this and, and analyze their own situation and look at their own selves because taqwa means to feel cautious about what we are doing. Taqwa means to protect oneself from harm that may come later. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect all of us in this gathering. So, talking about this lesson that we learned from Bani Israel, the ones who were playing the mental gymnastics games, Rasulullah mentioned a very powerful hadith. In it, he said وسلم, that whatever Allah has made halal, it is obvious. If something is halal, everybody can see it and know this is halal. And he said, and whatever Allah made haram, that's also obvious. If something is haram, anybody with common sense can look at you and tell you this is haram. Because most of Islam is common sense. Actually, I would argue all of Islam is common sense. And unfortunately, common sense is not very common. But they said, between the obvious halal and the obvious haram, وسلم, he said there are things that are doubtful. And they're not doubtful because they're doubtful in nature, but they're doubtful because people don't have enough knowledge about them. He said, those who know they're ruling, they know. And those who don't know, they don't know. And he said, as for the person who falls into the doubtful things, if you don't know if something is halal or haram, but you say, you know what? I don't care. And you do it anyway. Then Rasulullah said, this is as if you're doing the haram. And if you protect yourself from the doubtful matters until you find out what's the ruling on this for sure, then the Prophet ﷺ says you would have protected yourself and your deen. Protected yourself and your deen. And then he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's like a farmer, you know, who takes his sheep out grazing. He's got all this land to take his sheep out to. And he takes his sheep to the border of the land that's neighboring his neighbor's land. He said he could be in the middle of the land, he could be somewhere else, but if he goes to the edge of the land, 
Is it possible for some of the sheep to eat from the neighbor's land? Yeah. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, every king has borders around his land. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he also has given borders for us. Lines you're not supposed to cross. And that is the maharim, the things that Allah has made haram. Do not cross that line. Don't even go near it. And then he said, sallallahu alayhi wa and definitely in the body of the human being, there's a piece of flesh. If that flesh is sound, it's healthy, the whole body is healthy. And if that flesh becomes sick, the whole body becomes sick. And he said, sallallahu alayhi wa that is the heart. That's the heart. When the heart is healthy, the person doesn't seek the haram. The person doesn't justify ways to go to the haram. But if the heart becomes sick, then the person starts to yearn to do the haram. They become attracted by the haram. And I'm telling you, you know, one of the biggest things that's being washed away from the deen now, because we're getting washed down versions of Islam generation after generation, people have forgotten the concept of sin. There are some things that will get you in deep trouble with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some things that can take you to hellfire. So avoid the sin. Avoid the things that Allah has made haram. Because once you cross that path, it be, once you cross that line, there's a path that takes you deeper and deeper and deeper. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَاءَ sabira." It's a horrible path to live your life on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَلَا مَنْ كَسَبَ سَيِّئَةً فَأَحَاتَتْ بِهِ خَطِيَتُهُ فَأُولَيْكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ Whoever does a bad deed, an evil deed, and they become surrounded by their evil deed. Now what does that mean? They become the dwellers of the hellfire. What the scholar said is, sometimes you think, yeah, I'm just doing one wrong thing. But every sin has a chain that can lead you deeper and deeper and deeper. And all it starts it from the heart. Sometimes it just starts with the thought. Wouldn't that be fun if we just did this, right? And the thought comes in. If you follow that thought, and the thought might come in from waswasa from shaitan, or the heart is sick. Then you follow one thought, then it takes you to the next step, the next step, next step. And then what happens to the person before they realize that their religion is gone. Their iman is gone. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not test us like He tested people before us. Ya Allah rahman rahim Anyone here struggling to submit to you, Ya Allah, we ask you to increase our iman, Ya Allah. Make us people of the prayer, Ya Allah. Make us people who establish the prayer, Ya Allah. Make us people who wake up for fajr, Ya Allah. Ya Allah rahman rahim we ask you. Strengthen our Iman, Ya Allah. Grant us support from the people around us, Ya Allah. And surround us with good company, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Rahman, Ya Rahim, we ask you to not make us amongst those who justify doing the wrong things, Ya Allah. And we ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, grant us taqwa, Ya Allah, in our hearts, Ya Allah. And purify us, Ya Allah, from all of our sins, Ya Allah. Forgive us, Ya Allah, our major sins and minor sins, Ya Allah. Forgive us, Ya Allah, the open ones and the secret ones, Ya Allah. The intentional ones and the unintentional ones, Ya Allah. You're the one who forgives all sins, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Rahman, Anyone going through difficulties in their families, unite our hearts, Ya Allah. Anyone struggling in their health, Ya Allah, we ask you, grant us shifa, Ya Allah. And anyone struggling to earn for their families, Ya Allah, provide for us halal and tayyib risk, Ya Allah. And keep us away from the haram, Ya Allah. And we ask, Ya Rabbul Alameen, don't make us depend on anyone other than you, Ya Allah. And enter all of us here, hand in hand, with our loved ones into Jannatul Fardaus al-A'la, Ya Allah, and protect us from the hellfire. Wa akhir al-Dawana, and alhamdulillah, Rabbul Alameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Ameen. Qimu al-Salaam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah khair for watching. If you like what you saw, please subscribe and share. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you also. Jazakallah khair.